much for having me join this call, like I just said. Um, I'm still a relatively new researcher, but still, this is such an honor for me to be asked to talk about a subject I'm so passionate about. Uh, I hope this isn't too formal with a, a slideshow, but yeah, I'm going to go with it. I think it'll, I think it'll be good. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Parkinson's and the importance of research today. And uh, like Peter was so kind to introduce, uh, my name is Christy Silverside. And I'm doing my Bachelor of Science in Health Promotion um, and Honors, so my own independent research here at Dalhousie University. Um, so just before I get into all the fun research stuff, uh, I just want to quickly fill you in a little bit about my story, so kind of get an idea of where I'm coming from. And also throughout this presentation, please jump in at any time if you have any questions or comments or just want to add to it. Um, I always want to hear everyone's experience and how that applies to what I'm talking about. It just makes everything so much more applicable. Okay, so um, I am that, that girl in that picture. Uh, I'm from Toronto, Ontario, and I actually was a professional cook uh, during my previous career. Uh, I always found that cooking was a great creative outlet, and other than like really long hours and the physical wear and tear of being in a kitchen, uh, I really did enjoy that whole life. Um, but I decided about five years ago to give college a, a try. So I thought that would be a, a good idea to upgrade some of my skills and, and hone my knowledge. I enrolled at George Brown College in a culinary management program. And it was a little bit unique because it actually focused on nutrition and health and food science as opposed to just kind of the, the traditional French cooking of throwing butter and cream on everything, which mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, I think is really, really delicious, but we can only eat so much butter and cream and maintain our health, right? So, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, while I was there, I was uh, recruited to work in a food innovation and research studio. And that's a lab within the school that facilitates collaborations between uh, chefs like myself and then people from different business sectors. So specifically, the chefs would be hired to work as product developers or recipe developers. And so when I was there, my projects were usually around health, nutrition, and also chronic disease management. So uh, just to jump around for a minute, when I moved to Halifax, I actually started to volunteer with the Parkinson Society here and uh, helped out with last year's conference, as Peter said. And as you can see by this nifty photo here, I was actually at the Superwalk. So I may have seen maybe some of you there. And uh, luckily, very lucky opportunity for me starting in January as part of this degree I'm doing now at Dalhousie, I actually will get to do my internship at the Parkinson Society here in Halifax and I'm gonna help plan the conference. And, hey. uh, Yay, I'm super excited. Um, our first kind of planning meeting was about a week ago, and that's where we came up with the Mind Over Matter theme, and it's gonna happen on April 2nd, so everyone come and hang out. It's gonna be really fun. And um, so another question I get asked a lot is, why do I study Parkinson's? Um, I actually really do get that asked that all the time. Um, I've just seen uh, Parkinson's affect family and friends, and, and particularly my spouse's family. And so along with that, initial project I was involved in, which I'll talk about more in a second, I just I find it so interesting that this is a condition that affects physical, mental, and social health. And as a health promoter, uh, I'm also interested in just learning more about aging and chronic disease, and especially things with a Canadian focus, and I find that there's not as much research out about Canadians and how their health is affected by all this stuff. It's a lot of American or, or international literature that's just kind of assumed that it applies to Canadians as well, and I don't always agree with that. So before I go on about uh, my current stuff, I, I want to tell you about some of the, the first project I was involved in. And I think maybe a few of you on this call have heard about it before, but you get to hear it again. <laughs> so uh, the first project I did was called Live Well with Parkinson's. Has anyone heard of this website before? No. Okay. Well, I'm glad I get to introduce it to you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, this is uh, part of the, the food lab that I mentioned that I worked in, and we partnered with a movement disorders clinic that was housed in Baycrest and Sunnybrook hospitals in Toronto. And it was identified uh, through kind of their key contacts there that a, a good comprehensive tool was needed to convey important information to their clients with Parkinson's. And one area that was specifically identified to be lacking in information was recipes that had either higher or lower levels of protein and uh, protein interaction in food and levodopa is, it, it's kind of, that can affect its effectiveness. Effect, it's effectiveness, that's a, a lot there. But anyway, the protein can kind of counteract some of the, the benefits of the medication. So we came up with some recipes. Um, 
and so for this kind of research, it's more applied research because it was very hands-on, but it was a lot of trials and testing and retesting and also analyzing important nutritional content to make sure that the recipes that we're producing were you know, going beyond just calories, that there's some actual nutrients in there as well. And the um, best part of this project I found is once we finalized these dishes, we actually had a chance to do a live cooking presentation for our clients with Parkinson's and their caregivers and guests. And it was just so rewarding and, and really allowed me to see why research is so important and how it gives back to the community right away. And so the recipe development was really only one part of Living Well with Parkinson's. It is a whole website, so it's, that's the tool in itself. And it has a lot of other information about uh, different medications, which you're all a lot more familiar with than I am, but also uh, resources for common dietary issues, the recipes, and then other links and common um, reading material and questions and some educational videos as well. So just to talk about delicious things, the pictures I put up here are all things I specifically developed. So uh, kind of a low protein potato dish, a low protein uh, kind of date brownie orange bar thing, and then also a high protein vegetarian chili. So pretty easy recipes, pretty cool. They're all up on that website. So if you're looking for something new to try, definitely go check it out. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to dive into the, the research, but I just want to go over a few key concepts so that we're all on the same page here and research can get kind of convoluted with terms that are very scholarly. So stop me if I'm talking too much or if you have questions, please dive in with this stuff. Um, so as a quick review of different types of research, I always used to think of like research scientists in lab coats looking through microscopes and doing calculations. But as it turns out, there's a lot of different ways to do research and different types of research can give you uh, different views on an area of interest. And what I mean by that is you can, you know, look at cells under a microscope and, and see that picture of health, but you can also talk to people and get a whole different view of health. Uh, you could be talking about the same disease in both of those types of studies. Um, some research projects actually use a mixture of both of both methods. So that's just called mixed methods, but it's not really talked about too much. It's more just a technical term. Um, well, let's look at quantitative methods first. Um, this is great for answering kind of a certain type of question. And by that, I mean, you can either prove or disprove a theory. So this is, this is more of the, the black or white type of research. Uh, it, it really it develops experiments. It, does tests to gather its data, and then often the data is reduced to like numerical or statistical values. Um, there's usually a large sample sample size, or the people that participate <laughs> are, are very large because they want the results of these tests to be generalizable to the, the public at large or, or the community they're working with. So instead of just looking at a small segment of a community, say people with Parkinson's in Canada, they would do tests and it would be hoping for worldwide <laughs> applicability of the results. So you'll probably see a ton of these kind of tests come up when they're looking for participants in research. These are super important, but if you're kind of looking for what are giveaways for these type of uh, quantitative research, usually these sound exactly like an experiment and you'll be asked to perform a certain task or a test or even a survey and it's usually measuring something. So I think these pictures pretty much sum it up kind of the, the brain scan helmet thing, uh, often doing computerized tasks. Uh, sometimes you wear like eye trackers and stuff. I participated in a few of these, they're pretty fun. <laughs> uh, has anyone else got to wear one of those nifty head things where they track your brain waves? No, but it no. sounds cool. <laughs> it kind of does. Uh, it's pretty interesting to see results from that. Yeah, really. <laughs> Um, let's also look at some qualitative methods. Um, this type of research focuses on smaller groups of people and it, it often focuses on a shared experience among those people. So unlike traditional or, or quantitative research methods of data collection, this, this type of research is exploratory and it really seeks to understand the experience of the specific participant. So sometimes this information can be used to form a theory instead of just prove or disprove a theory. So this is kind of like the groundbreaking foundational work. And um, the data is collected through interviews or focus groups or uh, a new type of uh, research data collection that's coming out is called Photo Voice. And what Photo Voice is, is you give your participants a camera 
and you ask them to go out into the world and to take uh, meaningful pictures that are describing a certain experience. And then based on those photos that they take, you develop them and you ask them for the story behind the photo and use that to kind of elicit a story instead of just asking them to, you know, rate your pain on a scale of one to 10, which does not tell a story, in my opinion, anyway. I'm a little biased sometimes. <laughs> um, so in addition to all that, research can choose to become involved in the community they research or they can work with a community if the community themselves have a specific goal, but they're not quite sure of their options on how to achieve that goal. So those are all things that fall under qualitative research methods. It's, uh, it's a pretty broad umbrella of terms there. Um, so if you're looking at studies and thinking about participating in those, the way that you can tell if it's specifically qualitative is uh, looking for words or phrases that say, share your story or talk about your experience with. That's often found in the research study design. And uh, also looking for things like interviews or community meetings or focus groups. Anything like that in the description probably means that it's more of a qualitative focus. Does that make sense to everyone for the two types of research? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so, so, so I did a, a small test survey, so that would, that would be qualitative or no, quantitative. Yeah, if it's a survey, because they can take uh, the results of multiple surveys and then yeah. the value to it. And sometimes it's a little weird because they'll take data and like add values to like yes or no answers. It's, it's really interesting that the way they get results out of that. Okay. So I thought I would also give everybody here tonight an overview of what the research process looks like. Uh, because there's a lot of steps to it and can get kind of confusing, but I think once you know the backstory of how research is conducted, then it, it makes a lot more sense about all the different types of studies. Um, so I was actually going to use my own honor study here as kind of a, a guide and, and to put some, like a, a more of a story to this, so I'm not just using a lot of technical terms. Um, so I've actually been working since January on this study, and uh, it's really not a fast process. Um, I've done this with you. I know. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I think I was your first. You were, and you, <laughs> you have no idea what that, that interview means to me, and it's actually opened a lot of doors. I'll have to fill you in on some other stuff later. Though. Oh, good. <laughs> you know me sometime. Mm -hmm. So uh, my study is qualitative. I'm really not out to prove anything at this point, but I really need to explore areas that are not well understood. And I know uh, when I started to make my study, I wanted to find out about health beliefs around Parkinson's. So um, my kind of, oh, sorry. Um, I feel like I skipped a thing there. Yes, my research question. That's what I'm trying to talk about. <laughs> um, my research question was to explore how a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease impacts an individual's intentional health related behaviors. and uh, also how they have an effect on health and the onset or worsening of disease-related symptoms. So just basically looking at things you do to uh, maybe stop or um, resist the progression of, of your symptoms. And on top of that, I also want to build kind of this foundational knowledge for other people in this field that are kind of wanting to research this of the different barriers and facilitators you may face when you're trying to um, continue or engage or initiate new health behaviors in your life as uh, Parkinson's progresses. So to form these questions, it actually took a really long time. I did a lot of reading and searching in scientific literature. And scientific literature is just a, a fancy name for other research studies that have been published in academic journals. And um, when you go through all these journals, you're looking for uh, studies that have been reviewed by other peers. It's, it's a lot of kind of fact checking each other and, and making sure that uh, there's been no misrepresentation of data and that the study has used sound methods to reach its conclusion. So you're basing fact off fact and, and nothing's really assumed when it comes to all this. Um, so here's uh, what I found kind of from this, this literature review. And um, I'd really love everyone's feedback here if you could tell me if you think that this data is actually representative of your experience. So uh, first, I found just a generalized list of Parkinson's symptoms, and that included tremor, loss of mobility, communication issues, just general physiological disruptions, and also some mental health and neurological issues. So that kind of broadly sum it up. 
Yes. Um, Another thing that the literature pointed to specifically was that uh, Parkinson's disease affects uh, the quality of your life rather than life expectancy itself. Um, An interesting thing I found when I started going through more of the the qualitative literature that and qualitative by that I mean like things that described the whole experience. Um, Parkinson's receiving the diagnosis of Parkinson's was metaphorically compared to having a bomb dropped on your life. <laughs> Does that resonate with anyone? Actually, the bomb. A big bomb? Is that what you said, Peter? N A P A L M. Oh, like na- bomb. Na- 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 bomb. It's it's very wide. And it burns. Okay. Um, <laughs> She's taking notes. <laughs> uh, another thing that the research pointed to was that uh, symptoms are unpredictable, and because they're so unpredictable, that it can reduce your confidence just in your daily abilities. So. And then all together, all of those facts together, um, it kind of concluded that um, that can cause you to either withdraw or on the opposite end of that, give you increased motivation to engage in health-related behaviors. And just to define health-related behaviors, because I think that's pretty important, that's a key part of my study here, is uh, health-related behaviors, they refer to any action that improves, maintains, or degrades mental, physical, or social health and well-being. So pretty much any action, but... So good, so bad or good? Yeah, so really bad or good, because it can happen either way. I mean, I feel like you can receive this kind of news and it will motivate you to want to take more control of your own health, or you can receive this news and it can cause you to withdraw and feel helpless in your own body, so... Fear-based motivation, that's my word. So the literature, again, this fine scientific literature says that participating in the positive health related behaviors, so things that are improving or maintaining your your mental, physical and social well being is uh, obviously associated with an improved health status. But, you know, on the contrary, you choose to withdraw, um, then um, keeping away from positive health related behaviors is actually associated with cognitive deterioration. So there is some, some small support in there saying that you know, positive health behaviors are good, which makes sense. Um, and that, you know, ceasing to, to take care of your health might cause some, some problems. But then this is the part I found interesting, and I, I did try to probe during my, my data collection, was the literature also said that healthcare providers, and specifically around doctors and neurologists, tend to focus on prescribing medication. And they often fail to address kind of these other health related behaviors. So they kind of ignore the, the physical and mental and, and social well being parts of, you know, your health. Does anyone kind of agree with that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 know, they, they, they dare not venture forth from outside their comfort zone or, or their training level. How have you found it um, in being able to find good referrals, though? So if you're saying, like, okay, um, I don't want to increase my medication, or I'd like to, you know, prolong what I'm on as long as possible, who can I speak to about that option? Do they have referrals? They, they, they blank out. So, so, so far. Yeah, and that's kind do, of what I mean. Just like your, do you mean your doctor, or...? Yeah, like if you're a doctor or neurologist, if you t- spoke to them and said, who should I be talking to about, you know, maybe exercising a bit more or like, who should I be talking to? Like, how can I, you know, I think one of the, the things that I found pretty much across the board is that when it came to receiving a diagnosis, there was no next step. It was no like, okay, maybe no. you should be talking to this support no, they, no. They, don't, they don't give you a manual. They tell no. you you have it and send you on your way. <laughs> Which doesn't really make sense, right? Like, just in terms of, of maintaining and having control over your health, I just I don't really agree with that. So, oh, I was I was just referred to speech therapist. I was just referred to, uh, I was just referred to a speech therapist, and that referral actually never came back to me. So, and when was that? Recently, or like right after your diagnosis, or no? Oh, about two about two years ago, but yeah. but but. Yeah. He 
he gave the referral, but but whoever he gave it to never 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 contacted me. So I, I found my I found my own gal, and and I hire her privately. Yeah, and that's that's sort of another thing, and that's a, a whole other kind of arm of this project. But it's the the alternative healthcare providers that are willing to spend more time and are, are actually more knowledgeable in, in kind of physical, mental, social health area. It's not covered by health insurance unless yes. you have health insurance. So it's not always accessible to everyone else. So a lot of issues, a lot of issues with this. <laughs> so you can see how after doing this literature review, I was uh, not angry, but kind of disappointed and realized that we need to get a little bit more of a conversation going about this and have proof of this in the scientific literature. So the next round of researchers that build off this say, yeah, that's a problem. What can we do next? Mm -hmm. So let's go on to the study design. There we go. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned many times I am using qualitative methods to in my study here to gather data and my study is specifically exploratory because I'm like I said not trying to develop a theory but I'm looking to really tell the story of maritime residents and their health behaviors around Parkinson's and additionally I'm applying a qualitative description to, as my analysis method and qualitative description is a way of really generating that knowledge and uh, giving an in-depth uh, kind of description of the whole experience uh, without too much of you know my own biases going into this but taking people's words and really making sure that I tell that story. So the next important step in a study design is figuring out how you're going to recruit participants and that's probably the most difficult part. Uh, many research projects just don't happen because no one's actually willing to be studied or maybe they just don't know how to get in touch or find these studies. So. I found to increase the likelihood that I would actually be able to reach out and recruit people. Um, I kept my inclusion criteria, which are the factors that make you eligible to participate in studies, as simple as I possibly could. I got it down to three things. If you could live in the Maritimes, be diagnosed within the last five years and talk to me, you could, you could be in my study. <laughs> so some studies have super specific criteria, um, but I, I find those really more of the, the quantitative ones that are looking to test very specific things, maybe in the brain or in the blood. So they're looking for, for other kind of health factors into that. Um, so I feel like pretty lucky because I have a lot of contacts in this community and, and it's really made recruitment pretty possible for me. Uh, ethical considerations are another important factor in conducting research. Um, there's a lot of protective measures that are in place so that the participants of any studies are protected from any undue harm which I think is really important. And the ethics approval to move forward in the study is, is definitely like a long process and it's very back and forth. So you can send a proposal off to them and it will come back to you with revisions. And it's, you know, it's not just like, I'm gonna do this and someone stamps it and says, okay, there's a lot of conversations that go into that to make sure everyone's protected. And not only protected, but you know, that you are able to give them consent and that they can consent back to you in a, in a way that's okay and that their confidentiality is always protected along with their privacy and that also the participation is voluntary and most importantly that studies pose minimal risk so those are all really key factors and unless you can prove that your study is going to do that then it's really hard to get ethical approval and so when you combine all those four kind of key parts and um, that's kind of what makes your study proposal and that's what goes to ethics and takes a while to to go through until you can proceed so I, by this cartoon picture I found, I assume that's what an ethics board looks like. <laughs> I don't know, but I really hope. Um, and so they kind of debate all your issues and go from there. Um, let's look at some next fun stuff here. So um, data collection is the next main thing. And uh, for my study, I chose to do a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews. And uh, I recorded those and I transcribed them. I typed everything out. I listened to my own voice like you're doing now. And honestly, it gets a little tedious listening to your own voice, but I find everyone else is very interesting and there's a lot of emotion and a lot of things to share that way. So when interviews are transcribed, all identifying information is removed and then they're analyzed for uh, common themes and patterns and phrases. And that's called coding. And so when you take all your interviews at once and you kind of lay them out, a lot of these things start to emerge. It's really interesting. And you can kind of go back and forth and you do an interview and you code it and then you do the next one and all the themes come out. It's really, really amazing. It's kind of a, a touching process. 
And so now I'm kind of at the phase where I've completed all my interviews and, you know, I spoke to a bunch of people and these conversations could be brief. Sometimes it was 25 minutes and sometimes it was 45 minutes to an hour. And I'm just kind of analyzing, still just last little bit here, uh, just because the coding process takes so much time. And so I find that after you, like I said, listen and type in an interview, you actually feel like you understand the person that you are speaking to. Um, and I think that's another very important factor that differentiates the qualitative and quantitative research. And that's just the degree that you know your participants. I mean, as much as you remove all identifying information, you know, you know P3 like the back of your hand by the end, and instead of just being a kind of a code on a survey. So. How many, how many people have you had? Uh, I did five for this interview, and uh, the general research protocol for qualitative research is you want to get between four and six participants, and that's a great way to reach uh, the data saturation. So you should be able to get most of the key themes and, and um, patterns out of that. So very successful, uh, very good representation of all maritime provinces, <laughs> both rural and urban areas. I feel like I got a really good cross section of everybody, and even with age groups, the whole range was really really successful recruitment so very happy thank you <laughs> thank you for contributing to that and when do you have like results uh i will have everything done by december 15th oh very good <laughs> so 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 i'm trying to ask if, if you need anybody else are, are you done i have to be done just by just by the deadlines that are set by the school um we only have from January until December to get this done and that they just that's it. So I was <laughs> supposed to be done data collection a little bit earlier. I really did. I extended it right till the end of October. Um, which is fine. Just kind of I probably after I get out of this, I'm gonna go hunker down in a cave for a month and, and mm -hmm. type it out. <laughs> um, I understand the most that most researchers need access to people in short distance from Halifax. Yeah, that's, that's a big issue with um, research recruitment. It's that you do have to be so close to these big centers. And I set mine up specifically so that I could do phone interviews or, or over the computer if that would be better for people in other provinces, just because I didn't want to alienate anyone from farther distances or if anyone couldn't travel, because I just don't think that's fair. And, and that's one of my problems I kind of have with the research that's being done now, especially when you need to go in for clinical trials and you have to travel back and forth for six months. Yeah. This makes it very difficult for most people to actually participate in research. I didn't hear about your research. I, I participated over the internet with others. I, I participated with others over the internet. I didn't hear of your research. I would have volunteered. You would have done it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if I get to do a master's and I can continue this project, you're all going to hear from me. <laughs> yeah. And I think that we could probably do some fun stuff if we did uh, focus groups instead. So I'm going to keep this all in mind. <laughs> Sign me up. Okay, perfect. See, everyone's so willing to participate. It's great now. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'll just quickly, I'm almost done here telling you all this fun stuff, uh, just about the end of the research process. So uh, like I said, it's, it's time for the results and discussion time of this project. Um, and generally, this is all presented in a report. And this report just kind of describes the results, so it describes exactly what uh, the participants said. And in a kind of conclusion type area, you just give a little bit of possibility to the meanings. And it's usually using the same words or direct quotes from your participants. So like I said, I'm not taking on anyone's voice. I am just merely typing it into a paper that I can share with other people. And um, you know, my theory is the research process ended here. That wouldn't be very useful to anyone because this would just sit on my computer forever. So research results, whether they're good or bad or neutral, uh, they need to be shared. And so by sharing results, you actually help to from future studies and then you create a, a resource for others to learn from what you've learned. And so because results can be hard to access, researchers have a couple options to really get their word out. Uh, commonly, it will be published in an article in scientific literature like I discussed previously. Um, this is great for people that are in institutions and that do professional research, but generally, unless you have a subscription to one of these journals, which can be quite expensive, it's really hard to access this information. Um, so researchers, researchers may also choose to publish their work maybe 
um, on a blog, so online or maybe in a magazine. Or I actually even heard um, that there was an interview about Parkinson's on the radio the other day, and that's a really great word, way to get word out to everyone, so it's a little bit more accessible. And then you don't have to use so much kind of buzzwords here and say things like methodology, so that's nice. Will your report be available to all of us? Pardon? Will your report be available to all of us? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to send it out to you guys. I think I'll, I'll send it to Peter for distribution because okay. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Very good. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, so just the last way, and this is uh, another shameless plug, uh, a lot of researchers choose to go to conferences to actually make their work known. And so come to the conference next year on April 2nd so that we can talk about all of this a little bit more. And I think just the most important thing about conducting research and then finishing it off is just making sure it gets shared and the word gets out. So let's just share as much as we can when it comes to results because then things come out like that article I also read that you mentioned earlier about the woman that could smell Parkinson's. Like, that's pretty interesting. I hope that they do more scientific studies with that. I, I read sort of the synopsis and I think they gave her 12 shirts to smell without anyone in them. And she actually picked up that every single one of them had Parkinson's and it was really neat the way that was done. So if they could find yeah. a way to, to do a few more studies like that, that would be interesting. And, and I really like the idea of, of sharing with like, if we can get animals trained to identify that, that would also be really interesting. But these are the kind of studies that start these, these projects. So we've got to keep sharing and supporting these so that the word gets out. Absolutely. Oh, let's just talk about uh, the importance of getting involved and uh, things you should know about that. Um, so one of the key reasons you want to get involved in Parkinson's research is it's probably one of the best ways to stay directly connected with up-to-date advancements in this field of research. And also your personal data that you give, like all your information, uh, they all contribute to the final result of any study. So a little bit of you actually goes into the results of any study that you choose to participate in. And also you have a chance to make your voice heard and tell your story. And because research, research has to protect your identity, it always remains anonymous, but sometimes it's just therapeutic to share your story and, and share what you're going through and know that it's gonna be used for uh, you know, advancements in your particular area. And it's also pretty interesting because you might be exposed to different tests or exercises or ideas that would actually be really useful to you in your current situation. So maybe you'll be asked to do some kind of strengthening tests or some cognitive exercises just as part of a study and then you find that they're really helping you so you can incorporate them into your own life, which is pretty cool because you wouldn't find out about this stuff probably for another couple of years if they had to wait for all these studies to get published. And then lastly, I think one of the best reasons to get involved in research is you're going to actually be contributing to something that will directly benefit the next generation of people that are getting diagnosed with Parkinson's. All of these are great reasons to participate. So as much as there's some, some other things you should consider, just like travel costs and, and maybe some you know, personal factors or if you feel that some studies are better for you than others, I would say those are kind of your main concerns. But you know, the good thing about research is because it goes through all those ethical protection kind of processes, you always have the right to withdraw. You don't have to follow through with this, but just the, the fact that you're getting involved and getting out there and getting some more information, I think is always helpful. Um, I have a few opportunity websites that I just threw on here and I'm, I'm going to make sure that Peter gets a copy of these slides so that you can all refer to these websites if you want. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the first one is just the, the Parkinson's Maritime website. Uh, they do have a very easy to find volunteer for research section. Uh, I think that it's, it's usually a good place to find things that are around here. Um, but uh, like it was mentioned, sometimes the studies require that you travel to Halifax, which is a little bit of a barrier. Um, the second site I put up is the National Parkinson's uh, website with the clinical trials on it. I just put this link on here because I found that part of the, the national website really difficult to find. So I figured it would be good to have a link. And then the last one, Peter also sent out already in the, the reminder email, which was the Michael J. Fox page that actually just, you type in your information and it tells you the closest trials that you can participate in, which I think is a really great function to have there. It just makes it so easy. So all of those things, very important. And uh, I'll make sure that you all get a copy of those. And then just a few final thoughts. Um, I can only say so much because like, this is something I'm so interested in and, and I'm always immersed in conversation about this and I read a ton of literature, but I don't live with Parkinson's. So I found words from someone who does 
And um, I put a link up for this article as well, and it's just the perspective of someone with Parkinson's opinion on participating in clinical trials. And a nifty little video, also from the, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, just about the importance of participating in research. So I thought you might all find that interesting, and I also love those videos where they draw really fast with the hand on whiteboards. It combines everything I'm interested in all in one snappy video. So that's everything I have to say about research. Uh, I'd love to hear if anyone here has participated in stuff. Natasha, I know you have, <laughs> but I'd love to hear everyone else's experience if, if you've been interested or if you've participated in any trials or anything like that.